The rest of us just live here. Chapter six. Chapter the six, which Satchel finds a note on her pillow from Ken Kerouac, a friend since childhood, who always climbed the tree outside her window to sneak inside. The note tells her he thinks he's made a terrible mistake and that she should wear the amulet he's also put on her pillow. No matter what happens, Satchel puts the amulet on and calls her police officer uncle, who has already taken Kerouac's father has already taken Kerouac's father to identify his son's remains. My alarm goes off that night at 11.30 p.m. I wouldn't normally be asleep that early, but I couldn't put off taking at least half a painkiller. It turns out there are muscles you didn't even know could hurt until they're suddenly crashed into by a huge flying deer. I get up slowly, very slowly, and even then I can't keep from calling out in pain. I pull on a hoodie, but actually find it too painful to reach down and tie my shoes. So I slip up into some flip-flops. I wait and listen. The house is quiet. Mom went to bed early because she's going down to the Capitol in the morning for the meetings with the state party about getting the jump on McQuenzie's seat. No one, would, no one else would care if I was up anyway. Mary Magdalene greets me on the landing, staring at me intently. Come on, then, I whisper, and she follows me down the stairs, purring already. I let myself out the front and try not to crunch too much on the gravel in the driveway. The rain stopped, but the fog has come on. The faraway streetlights down our road give the world a blank white glow. Mary Mags does a silent little cat run ahead of me, exiting our driveway and softly uh, toward the entrance of the field where Jared's car is parked. In my lifetime, we've had one, the undead, two, those soul-eating ghosts, three, the vampire cycle of romance and death, and four, Whatever might be happening now with the body of Finn and the terrified deer, if they're even connected, they probably, they're probably connected. When Jared's granddad was a teenager, they had gods. The indie kids back then, who were probably called hipsters or something, fought and some of them died and a crack opened in the ground and ate the ho a whole neighborhood. But of course, the gods and goddesses were defeated in the end because we're all still here. They were sent back to wherever they'd come from. And the world, as it always does, got on with pretending it never happened. The crack was put down to a volcanic earthquake, and history forgot. Except for one goddess, who had met Jared's future granddad called Herbert, <clears throat> clearly not a hipster, and liked what she saw. They married. They had a daughter, Jared's mom. There's a whole story there. But Jared's even more private about this than liking guys. Jared's secretive about everything. Jared isn't even... His first name. It's his middle. His first name is so totally awful. No one knows it but me. Anyway, Jared's half goddess mom married Jared's dad, and they have <clears throat> they had their son, born two months and two days before I was. His grandma and his mom aren't around anymore. Grandma went back to her realm when Herbert died, and his mom runs the international charity trying to save lions, tigers, and leopards from extinction. I think she's might still be technically married to Jared's dad, but she hasn't been around since Jared was a kid. Which just leaves Mr. Sherwin, who teaches junior high geography. We had him in eighth grade. Jared told me he thinks of himself as three quarters Jewish, one quarter God, which he also says makes him a lots of questions he doesn't really know the answers to. He had a bar mitzvah. It was so much fun. Mostly, though, he doesn't talk about it. The God thing, which you probably wouldn't either if your grandmother was the goddess of cats and you were a great big 18-year-old gay linebacker trying to live a normal non-indie kid life. But it may, it might have been different if she had been here, like goddess of fire or prosperity or something. Still, <clears throat> I've known Jared my whole life, and he's never once acted resentful about the way cats, well, worship him. He treats them kindly, patiently. He gives them recognition and he sends them on their way. He can also heal them. Now, you know there are limits here, right? He says, putting a hand on my cheek. You're not feline and I'm only the grandson of the real deal. I know, I say. I just don't want you to get your hopes up about what I can do. I haven't. I would if I could. I laugh a little, then wince at the ache. That's what everyone knows about you, Jared. You always would if you could. Well, he says, people think 
they know a lot of stuff. This might hurt. There's a sudden heat on my cheek that feels like it's pulling at my stitches and light comes faintly from the palm of Jared's hand. I try not to flinch as it gets hotter, but then he stops. He peels back the bandage. Looks a little better, he says. I don't think I can do anything about the scar, though. It's okay, I say. I feel It feels a lot better. And it does. It's still tender to the touch, but it feels like there. it's three or four more days along in the healing process. That's about all Jared can do to non-cats, but it still as hell takes the ache out of my ribs when he touches them and makes my nose feel a lot less like I've got an apple-sized cold, apple sized cold sore on my face. He's always done this for us. Sports injuries, colds, headaches. We can't quite get rid of them, but our doctors and parents are constantly amazed at how robust our immune systems are. He can. He also can't do anything about what's wrong inside our heads. What's in your head is still illness, but way more complicated than any muscle ache. Those times he saved me from those loops, he's just saving me as a friend rather than a guy. But he's made a whole lot of other shit a whole lot easier. But now, here's the thing. You may not believe this. You may not believe any of this, actually, about his grandma, his grandma, about Jared, hell, about the indie kids or the vampires or whatever. You may think this is all down to my own mind, making my body feel bit better because I believe Jared can, but I don't care what you think. Not about these things anyway. If you don't think they're real or important, or you think that we'll all grow out of this nonsense, well, that's not really my business. I can't tell you what's real for you, but in return, you can't say what's real for me either. I get to choose, not you. Jared sits back in his seat, tired, and looks out into the fog. Mary Magdalene is sprawled in the back, purring, sprawled in the back, purring like she just had the best sex of her life. There are other neighborhood cats out here too, tons of them, attracted by Jared acting godly, which I guess is like a cat lighthouse. You can see their eyes reflecting the headlights from Jared's car, and several have hopped up on the hood and trunk, all of them purring, some of them kneading their paws gently against the metal or the windows. I try, I'll try to sneak into Hannah to see Henna in the morning, Jared says. Though, I'll have to avoid her mom and dad. He turns to me. How did I get so unpopular among parents? I'm the kind of kid other parents are supposed to love. Henna's parents have never said exactly why they don't like Jared, but it's easy to guess. There are rumors about Jared's parentage, and that even, and that even Jared can't keep them from circulating, and if very religious Mr. and Mrs., Silver Nine don't actually quite believe them. Their stories still leave a kind of residue that makes them nervous. For my parents, or my mom at least, the answer is a lot simpler. You hear about McQuenzie? I ask him. Oh yeah, here we go again. Mr. Sherman has run against my mother in every single one of her elections. He's lost every single one. The political demographics out here are is never going to get him more than 45% of the vote. But he keeps on running. They're in exactly the same district for everything. So he's been up against her for the state house the four times she's ran. <coughs> They're in exactly the same district for everything. So he's been up against her for the state house the four times she ran, both times for the state senate, and now almost certainly again for Congress. It's occasionally made our friendship a bit strange, well, stranger, but we've stuck it out, much to my mom's annoyance. Mr. Sherin is so nice, it never come, it never occurred to him that we could be anything but friends. I'll bet Mel will vote for your dad, I say. I don't know if she should, he says. Feels weird doing that against your own parent. You can't stand my mother. Yeah, but there's no need for war, is there? No need to actually hurt someone. Thinking like that might be why your dad loses all the time. Jared laughs. I don't think he'd know what to do if he ever won. It won't be for months anyway, I say. Not until we're both gone. Maybe this time we can just leave them to it. Jared and I are going to different colleges, both of us, with scholarships and huge loans that will probably follow us until death. But those colleges are in the same city two states away. The plan is we'll stay friends. The plan is we'll maybe get an apartment together later to save money. The plan is maybe we'll never come back to this town. The colleges are 45 minutes apart, though. 
So it's going, is it going to be easy as I hope to keep our plans? Even here, we don't get into the town that's an hour away very often, but I don't want to think about that for now, right now. I stretch the passenger seat, feeling the aches lessen by quite a lot. I can even reach down to my feet, which are now, which are freezing now in the stop car. Movement catches my eye and I watch as a mountain lion emerges from the fog and circles over to Jared's side. Hey there, moose, missus, he says, opening his car door. He puts his hand on the mountain lion's head and does one long stroke all the way down to the end of her tail. Even heard, ever heard a mountain lion purr like a broken drain. She leaves huge cat footprints on the damp of the field as she sits like a statue a little bit away from the car. Just a dark spot in the shadows. I know from experience that she'll wait there patiently until we leave, guarding us from danger if she can. Now that, Jared says, closing his door, that shit is crazy. I told Hannah I loved her, I say, right before we hit the deer. He looks at me surprised. She had time to say anything back. I breathe in slowly through my nose. Then I realize I can breathe through my nose. I touch it lightly. Good job, I say. Thanks. She said she didn't think I did. Jared looks with thoughtfully. That's a weird response. Yeah, I say. Yeah. But I held her hand until the paramedics got there. And the last thing she said before they knocked her out was my name. I don't tell him what she said about Nathan and the prom. I'm kind of hoping the accident won't have... Made her forget. Is that bad? Dude, Jared says, rubbing his eyes. Healing kind of takes it out of me. I think I need to get to bed. Yeah, I say, thanks again. No problem, my friend. He takes a deep breath and opens his door again. Let me go out and hand out benedictions first. A hundred cats and one mountain lion watch him eagerly as he steps out towards them. Hands up. How are you feeling? Mel asks, waiting for me to come as I come back inside. I think I'm lying about how okay I am with this, this scar. I thought that was a possibility. We sit down on the couch, turning on the muted television for light. A topless woman with a gun in each hand is shooting Asian people down a long hallway. Then her cut-off jean shorts are obviously bothering her, so she takes those off and now is wearing only a G-string, keeps on shooting. I don't understand the world sometimes. Mel changes the channel to a show about dogs. The thing about scars, though, she says, nothing you can do except wear them with pride, says the girl with flawless skin, says the girl who destroyed her tooth enamel from chronic force vomiting, says the girl whose boobs could be outshone by a nine-year-old boy because I starved myself through a key developmental stage. There's a different kinds of scars, brother. I watch the flashing, silent nonsense image of dogs wearing costumes. You going to be okay with mom running for Congress? Does it matter? She didn't actually ask us, did she? She thinks we're all better. Are we? Aren't we? I repeated what I said to Jared. It won't be for months. We'll be out of here. Mel, who has that combination of total self-belief and utter self-doubt that is more common than people think, is planning on medical school. While doubting she'll, she's going to pass history. She'll probably do both. And if her final grades are what they should be, and they will be, she's going to college way on the other coast, uh, way on the whole other coast, thousands of miles away. You shouldn't say this about your sister, but I kind of already miss her, even though she's sitting right there, right here. I wake up at 3.43 a.m. because my dad has sat down in my bed. He's crying. I'm sorry I wasn't there. He weeps. I'm so sorry. He's still in his work suit. He stinks. Go to bed, Dad, I say. I'm okay. No, you're not. He shakes his head. He says, shaking his head. You're not okay at all. All right, then. I'm not okay. But it's the middle of the night, and you're waking me up is kind of making everything less okay by the minute. He makes a little sobbing sound. I should kill myself. I should just drive off a bridge and make all of your lives better. That'd be a waste of a good car, especially if it belonged to Uncle Rick. I could park the car and jump. What bridge, though? There aren't any around here high enough. You'd only break your legs, and then you'd more, be more of a pain in the ass than you are now. He sighs. You're right. You're so right. He starts crying again. Dad, 
You're a good kid, Mikey. You're the best kid. His voice breaks. Dad, seriously. He slides to my bedroom floor, still crying. Within minutes, he's snoring. I take my blankets and go sleep on the couch.